Hello again. I'm Dr. Reina Reyes of the National Institute of Physics in UP Diliman. And in this lecture, we've been discussing the question, is there life elsewhere in the universe? Previously, we've discussed the Drake equation and the six factors uh, that compose um, this way of estimating the number of civilizations that have formed over the history of the observable universe. In this uh, next part of the lecture, we will talk about the first three astrophysical factors, n star, f sub p, and n, n, n sub p. The first factor, n star, is just the number, total number of stars in the observable universe. The observable universe is defined by cosmologists to be the area, the region of space, um, such that light would have had time, has had time to reach us um, since the Big Bang. So since the beginning of the universe is in our standard uh, cosmological scenario, um, it happened 13.8 billion years ago. So this is actually a sphere around us uh, around the Earth and the Sun in our galaxy um, that is expanding as we speak, essentially expanding um, every second, every day, uh, because uh, as time progresses, uh, there's more and more uh, space out there uh, that would have had time to reach us. Um, of course, uh, that change is negligible. Um, so the idea is that we can actually uh, map um, this uh, region of space, and that is what we um, call our observable universe. Um, and in that region, we can estimate the number of galaxies there are, and it turns out to be to have hundreds, uh, hundreds of billions of galaxies, and each of those galaxies, in turn, have hundreds of billions of stars. So our own Milky Way galaxy has uh, three times 10 to the 11 stars. That's uh, 10 to the 11 in scientific notation is um, one followed by 11 zeros. So three times 10 to the 11 is actually 300 billion stars in our galaxy. And some galaxies are smaller, some galaxies are bigger, but more or less, um, this is a, the order of magnitude of the number of stars in a given uh, galaxy. Now you take all the stars in all the galaxies and you get this big number and that's um, 2 times 10 to the 22. So that's um, 1 followed by 22 zeros. Um, so we don't translate it into words anymore. Uh, we use our scientific notation to uh, express these very large numbers, uh, which are actually very common in the field of astronomy. And so this is a humongous number, uh, and that's sort of the number of chances you have uh, of creating solar systems and creating life and creating civilizations. And that's where we start from, and this is in a way a numerical estimate, a numerical um, um, way of putting um, the message, the quote of um, Dr. Ellie Arroway that we uh, shared in the early part of this lecture, that the universe is so vast um, and there's so much space out there um, for, for life uh, out, uh, outside our own, outside of our own planet. So now we go to the next factor, which is we ask uh, how many of those stars actually have planets. And um, for a long time, um, we actually didn't know the answer to this question. It was an open question. We know that uh, our sun has uh, eight planets uh, orbiting it. Um, but with our um, technology and um, astronomical observations, uh, we are now able to routinely discover new um, exoplanets. So we call them exoplanets. These are planets that are 
orbiting around other stars in the galaxy. You can check this uh, NASA website for the exoplanet catalog and it updates every day. So as of um, this week, we have over 4,000 confirmed exoplanets um, in over 3,000 planetary systems. So what this, this is telling us is that um, our solar system is actually uh, not very rare. It's actually very typical for stars to have planets uh, orbiting around them. So in a way, if you go back to uh, uh, the formation of stars, there's actually um, debris that um, rotates around the protostar and eventually the, those um, dust and pieces of uh, ice and rock um, coalesce and form eventually these, uh, what we uh, of course know as planets. So how have uh, these exoplanets been discovered? Uh, there are actually many different, um, many different um, ways to find a planet, but the most, um, most, um, one of the most successful um, ways is through um, observing this, um, this transit, the planetary transit, and that, that um, manifests as a dip in the light curve of the star. So, uh, the Kepler Space Telescope, which is the um, a NASA uh, space telescope sent out uh, to or uh, in orbit around the Earth, is has actually been um, observing a patch in the sky, uh, and and observing the brightness of those stars, and the purpose is to look for these dips in the light curve. That are signatures of having a planet. Um, so in this um, diagram here, you can see, uh, imagine that the planet is uh, crossing the surface of the star. And as it crosses, um, the planet blocks some of the light from the star. And so we see uh, lower brightness. Um, as you see the dip in the curve. And as the uh, planet exits, um, you see that the light curve goes back to the original level um, that is the just the uh, unblocked um, brightness of the star. And then you see this periodically as the planets uh, orbits in a regular, um, with a regular period around this star. And you can figure out many of the properties of the planet uh, based on these observations. So um, the Kepler Space Telescope has uh, discovered um, many, many of these planets and with their parent stars. And this is one um, illustration. So again, we are not actually capturing the images here, uh, but this is an illustration of the relative size of the planet to their parent star. And in the... Um, um, in the diagram with the arrow, that's actually an illustration of the sun and Jupiter is the dot that's blocking it. And that is what would, um, it would look like, of course, from the point of view of someone outside our solar system um, who may happen to also be observing the transit. Um, the Earth is also there, but I think it's almost too small to see. Uh, from this uh, slide. Um, so the other uh, candidate planets uh, you see also as uh, little dots uh, blocking part of their parent stars. Now, what we're able to do with this, um, with this, with these observations, is that we can make an estimate of how of of this number uh, that we that is in the Drake equation, uh, f of p, f sub p, the fraction of stars that form planets. And what we found is that it's almost actually equal to one. So very close to one, meaning, again, that planets are actually 
uh, very typical. So you can have a um, view uh, if there's a star, there's actually also a big chance that uh, there's a planet um, or one or more planets orbiting it. So um, the next um, factor is something uh, is, is now um, asking about the number of habitable planets in that um, solar system. So N sub P is the average number of planets in the habitable zone um, of the star. And as we said earlier, this is based on whether water can form, uh, water can exist in liquid form. So as illustrated here, your distance from your star has to be just right. So sometimes this is also called the Goldilocks zone. So not too hot. Um, so if you're too, um, too close, uh, then uh, water will um, be in uh, gaseous form, water vapor. Uh, on the other hand, if you are too cold, uh, water will form into ice or solid form. So it has to be just right in this habitable zone or Goldilocks zone um, to have liquid water that we know is um, crucial for life here on Earth. So in this uh, chart, I actually see uh, um, exoplanets in addition to our solar system planets uh, and the habitable zones um, of their respective parent stars. So you see there the sun, um, that yellow orb there. Uh, and then as you go out, uh, is the farther away you are from your star. So Venus uh, is close in, just outside the habitable zone. Um, so it's too hot for liquid water to exist. And then you have the Earth, um, which of course, you know, has lots of liquid water. And then Mars, uh, which also um, we believe had liquid water in the past, um, is also in the uh, habitable zone of the Sun. And these other exoplanets are also in the habitable zones of their stars, which are a bit uh, dimmer than the Sun. And you can see, for example, there, Capist uh, 1D, 1E, 1F, and 1G, they belong to the same uh, planetary system, and they have actually uh, four uh, exoplanets that are within the habitable zone. Again, taking all of the data that we have together, scientists can estimate this number, N sub P. And they find that the average number of planets in the habitable zone of a star with planets is around 0.2. So um, it's less than one, but it's actually not a very, very uh, small number. Uh, it's two out of 10, uh, which is um, not too far from uh, the, the figure for the solar system, uh, which is two out of eight, right? So there are two planets in the habitable zone, that's Earth and Mars, out of the eight planets in the solar system. I'm sorry, Pluto, but you're not considered a, re a real planet. So that's two over eight, which is one over four, which is around 25%. Uh, which is not very far from the 20%, um, taking uh, all the different uh, planetary systems. Okay, and you notice here that Venus is technically not in the habitable zone of the sun, uh, but you may have heard of some news of um, a sign of life, a biosignature detected in Venus. And we'll discuss this exciting discovery as part of the next part of this lecture. <laughs> 